Welcome to the History of Retinas, Milestones in Retina series. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, and in this installment, we will explore the discovery and evolution of a treatment that truly revolutionized the field of retina and the lives of patients around the world virtually overnight. That treatment is, of course, antivascular endothelial growth factor therapy, also known as anti-VEGF. It goes without saying that there are many who have contributed mightily to the success of anti-VEGF therapy, researchers, clinicians, patients, and those in industry partnering with us. Today, we will celebrate and share this amazing story of innovation by tracking anti-VEGF's miraculous discovery and the extraordinary therapeutic developments that followed through the first-hand accounts of our incredible expert panel. Joining me today is Dr. Joan Miller, the David Glendening Kogan Professor of Ophthalmology and Chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School. She is also Chief of Ophthalmology at both Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary and Massachusetts General Hospital, as well as the Ophthalmologist-in-Chief at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Julia Haller is the Ophthalmologist-in-Chief at the Wills Eye Hospital. She is a leading retinal surgeon scientist who has innovated translational advances against blindness on many fronts. Dr. Jeffrey Heyer is the Director of Vitroretinal Services and Director of Retina Research at Ophthalmic Consultants of Boston. He is one of the country's leading retinal clinical researchers and has an impressive body of work that includes numerous anti-VEGF trials dating back to its inception. And Dr. Jay Duker, who has devoted more than 30 years to the field of retina and ophthalmology, holding roles in clinical research, academics, and business. He is currently the president and CEO of iPoint Pharmaceuticals and remains active in clinical practice at the Tufts University Eye Center. Thank you all for joining us here today. The four J's. So today's kind of an opportunity for us to look at the impact and development of anti-VEGF therapy and really tell that story from those of you who have lived it. For the start of this, I'd like to start with Dr. Joan Miller. Dr. Miller, can you give us an idea of, of what the landscape looked like right before and around the development of anti-VEGF? But when we finished our training in sort of the late 80s, early 90s in retina, there was not a lot to do from active degeneration. We had laser photocoagulation and we, we read and, and followed all the you know, macular photocoagulation study uh, guidelines. But basically, the laser photocoagulation that was available caused uh, damage to the neural retina and a scotoma. So it was really not an appealing treatment either for the doctor or for the patient. One of the things that you had an interest in was moving away from that thermal, hot, ablative laser toward a, a new approach to laser therapy. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that story? So as a young attending, when I was at Mass Ioneer, there was a, a photosensitizer called vertiporfin that was actually in clinical trial for metastatic uh, skin cancer. And so that meant that it had gone through all of the talk studies was being used in, in patients so that if we could figure out what the dosimetry was and it was effective, we could get to a clinical trial. And I went to Coherent and uh, needed to have them build me a laser because you needed uh, a different laser than folks were using for the tumors that gave you the spot sizes to treat in the macula, but also the very low energies that you used in photodynamic therapy. And it was just a lot of empiric slogging to try to figure out the dye dose, the timing of the dye infusion, which are radiance and fluence, and slogging through a lot of experiments in large animals. We, we really came up with a dosimetry that seemed to be effective and reasonably selective. And that led to clinical trials that these folks were a part of. 
And the first patient was treated in 1995 at Mass Ioneer, and we went very quickly to phase three trials. And interestingly, enrolled in the phase three trials that, of course, were multi-center and involved Europe as well as the U.S., and we enrolled over 600 patients in six months, which just is a testament to the fact that there really wasn't anything else out there. And that led to um, positive results and approval of photodynamic therapy with ritoporfin or visudine treatment in 2000. Dr. Heyer, it's interesting because that was kind of the focus at the time. And then we had this major transitional shift. And I think you were... Um, active in some of the early uh, studies that looked at that. Could you take me through that shift from photodynamic therapy potentially to our first uh, anti-VEGF and then, and then the anti-VEGF going, story going forward? The work that Joan did with photodynamic therapy was critically important because finally we had a treatment where we weren't destroying the retina to try to preserve vision and at least to stop the neovascular process. Around that time, the first activity with anti-VEGF therapy was being studied. And it was in the late 1990s, early 2000s that a lot of these studies were starting. The first, um, really the first advance was with a drug called uh, pegaptinib. And that was a company called iTech, and they had large studies going, looking at intravitreal injections for wet AMD. And remember, that was a, a huge leap of faith because up to that time, the only injections that were done in the eye were very bad eyes, very diseased eyes, endophthalmitis, CMV retinitis. So the concept of injecting into eyes that were essentially healthy with the exception of macular disease was something that uh, took some faith from retina specialists. With both photodynamic therapy and pegaptinib or macogen, we were seeing positive effects. But if you looked at overall vision in these patients, patients on average still lost vision. So with photodynamic therapy, the visual loss curve was muted but they still lost vision, similar with pegaptinib. And around that same time, there was another drug being developed by Genentech. The drug at the time was called Rufab V2. Um, it was obviously the precursor to Lucentis. I was relatively new on the scene. This was early 2000s. We hadn't been involved in the iTech studies up to that point. So we were one of a few sites that were involved in the Genentech study. The study started, nobody was enrolling in the study. So the first five patients that were multi-dose in the study were all here at OCB. And I'll never forget, two of them were enrolled within a couple of days of each other. And one of the first ones to come in was, it was the patient's second eye she had already, uh, you know, legally blind in the fellow eye, and she had just lost vision to roughly the 2100 level, came in hysterically upset. She had now lost independence. She was the driver in the family for her husband as well, who couldn't drive. We treated her, and at that time, you saw patients at day one, three, seven, and 14. So we had very, very close follow-up. She came back on day one and her vision had gone from roughly 2100 to 2040 with a dramatic response. And that was very um, characteristic of these first five patients. Can we go back to the how, it, how we figured out that it was VEGF? Because I think that is telling because really the data was was all in ischemic retinopathies and edema, not in AMD. <laughs> you know, so the <clears throat> we had we developed these large animal models, you know, that we were using uh, to test different drugs, you know, the NGH lactic steroids that didn't work. But at the in the uh, you know, and people had been looking for this so called factor X, like what was the thing that was driving abnormal blood vessels in all these diseases? That was something that Michelson questioned in the 40s. And we knew something was there, but really hadn't identified it. And it was really in 1983 that Hal Dvorak and, and Don Sanger identified 
from ascites, a molecule they called vascular permeability factor, which is kind of ironic given where we're going to head. Uh, but it was in 1989, Napoleon Ferrara identified what he called vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF, which was secreted, angiogenic, uh, and, uh, and was driven by hypoxia. And it turned out they were the same molecule. And of course, that looked very interesting to those who are interested in ophthalmology. And so we used those same large animal models to collect aqueous fluid and found uh, that the levels of VEGF were undetectable you know, when the eyes were normal, but went up abruptly and then correlated with the degree of the severity of the iris neovascularization. And that was work uh, with you know, Pat DeMore and then Tony Adamas and Pat's uh, grad student, David Scheima. And when and, and David Shima and Tony had actually also looked at RPE cells and shown that VEGF was in RPE cells, also responded to hypoxia. And then, of course, there was interest in trying to block it. And uh, George King and Lloyd Aiello and Lois Smith, Eric Pierce used uh, siRNAs to inhibit in a mouse model. And then we actually got antibodies from Napoleon Ferrara that was essentially early Avast, and it was the full length antibody injected into the vitreous of these eyes and completely blocked iris neovascularization. And uh, that was pretty exciting. We didn't think it would be that good. We also took VEGF and injected into normal animal eyes and recapitulated all of the, uh, all the iris neovascularization and the neovascular glaucoma. So we sort of at that point, and this was in by 1995-96, we'd shown that VEGF was associated uh, VEGF could be inhibited to completely block the new vessels and that it was sufficient. And in that same era, uh, Lloyd Aiello and George King had published the patient study showing the correlation with diabetic retinopathy uh, in the large, large paper published in the New England Journal. So you really had the whole story. I mean, it looked like it was factor X and this is 1996. <laughs> and so we did go to Genentech. I was like, okay, hey, we're ready to go. Let's go into patients. I totally remember and this. And they, they were like, first of all, you know, they learned about macular, macular degeneration was the indication because it was such an unmet need, but the data at that point was really better, you know, in RBO or diabetic macular edema. But in any case, they just were not keen on going into anything ophthalmologic and they had all these other good drugs they were pursuing. So they kept going back and forth, you know, are we going to, do it ourselves? Or are we going to license it out? And they really didn't get too far. And that's why Marty Glick left and joined David Geyer. And they went and licensed the Aptomer, which became Pigaptinib and Macugen and formed iTech to really develop that. And it was, you know, Dave Geyer in that group, and then later joined by Tony that really pursued the clinical trials. And I think that that was the driver for Genentech until Macugen, you know, again, started by their own people. <laughs> Uh, you know, with iTech, until that looked like it was promising, they really didn't uh, go seriously into in, back into ophthalmology. Yeah, what an exciting time to actually see visual improvement. Dr. Haller, at Wilmer, there was a structure where there was a medical retina and a surgical retina. Um, you were early on the surgical retina team. Can you tell me a little bit about what that was like and how you ended up being so actively involved in the anti-VEGF story? The reason I got involved was because medical retina people, and, it, and at Wilbur there was, I hate to use the word schism, but there was definitely a divide between medical retina. And that's because a number of people had grown up with Arnold Patz and the development of laser and were not retina surgical trained. Our medical retina people didn't want to do the intravitreal injections. They considered them surgical procedures and weren't comfortable with them. And it's amazing to think back, but there was a lot of thought that patients wouldn't accept injections in the eye and that it wasn't a practical route for treating patients. They, they would accept laser, but not injections, invasive procedures in the eye. And so when the early Genentech, as, as Jeff was just talking about, the RUFAB uh, trials came up, just the phase one studies, um, none of the medical retina people were interested in doing it. And I said, well, I'll, I'll try it. You know, why don't we see? We were really 
starting off looking at safety. So we were injecting um, eyes with discoform scars, you know, just to see if, if the drug had any toxicity. Dan Martin and I, I think the same day, uh, injected the first two eyes and didn't have any toxicity. It wasn't until a few weeks later, I think maybe Steve Schwartz was the first to try something that looked more active and it dried up. And, uh, you know, I, I remember being with Dan at the Macula Society and going, you really think this could work? You know, <laughs> is it possible? Um, and uh, yeah, so ironically, uh, from the surgical perspective, I got involved in uh, the medical retina trials, uh, and that, and then it it changed the world. Dr. Duker, Jay, can you tell us a little bit about what the early OCT days were as regards anti VEGF for you? It does appear that for all four of us, there was a certain degree of serendipity right place at the right time at the right point in our career that really enabled us to blossom with a certain area of research. With respect to OCT, again, for me, it was clearly right place at the right time. Uh, I was starting out in a career. Uh, I originally went into private practice for a very short period of time. Little did I know at the time that the practice I joined was undergoing a divorce. And uh, when they asked me to choose sides, I said, I think I'm going to go somewhere else and went down the street, uh, really to Tufts when Tufts was at a, at, at a moment when they were you know, building a new department, essentially. And we had access through the collaboration uh, with Jim Fujimoto at MIT to the earliest prototype of OCT, which when it was first brought in, a uh, being, again, the surgeon, more, less medically oriented, I, I was skeptical that this was going to be a benefit until I saw the first image of a macular hole. And then that's all it took. So the story got a little bit more interesting when we got a fellow who had been a resident in Indianapolis, Adam Martinez's his name, and Adam was uh, involved in some of the first intravitreal steroid papers. And Adam convinced the faculty at Tufts to try an intravitreal steroid injection for wet macular degeneration. Patient came back a month later, no change in vision, no change in symptoms, but we had an OCT. And we were able to show on the OCT that the intraretinal fluid was gone. So there was an anatomic benefit, but not a visual benefit, which we would have never seen without that OCT machine. And this was right at the time that uh, people were starting to look at other types of medical therapies for macular disease. And the reason OCT caught on so fast it was a conjoining of these two things, a diagnostic tool, but it also became a therapeutic guiding tool. And of course, nowadays you can't think of treating any macular disease without an OCT. But back then, uh, because the anti-VEGFs were so effective, you actually didn't need anatomic proof. I remember Rick Ferris saying, to your point, somewhat sardonically, that if it weren't for OCT, so many drugs wouldn't have, have been successful because vision didn't improve at all because <laughs> initially, but you could see the anatomic improvement. But the original idea was actually to do real-time measurements of corneal thickness to know when to stop PRK. And the problem was the plume of debris that came out from the surface of the cornea from the eczema laser blocked the light. And so it didn't work. But then somebody said, well, if you can image the cornea, you should be able to image the retina. Just put a lens in front of it. And it's not clear who that person was, depending on who you talk to about historically. Uh, and that is how the first image was obtained. But again, a little bit of serendipity where I think the message here is you, you have to be data driven and your hypotheses have to be somewhat malleable because sometimes you get a result you don't expect. There's no question anti-VEGF therapy helped make OCT and OCT helped make anti-VEGF therapy. Because as you said, we've been seeing responses that you would never know from the patient's response alone. And, and I keep thinking back, clearly anti-VEGF therapy is in our time is is the greatest advance we've seen. But the advent of OCT so clearly helped us understand the disease and disease responses in a way that we wouldn't have been able to with our current imaging. I wanted to get 
back also to what the intravitreal injection piece, because I think another reason you know, that we thought treatment should be local was because of the alpha interferon trial, which, you know, the older ones of us would remember. And that really came out of Wayne Fung in San Francisco, who got the idea actually from Judah Folkman also, and treated some patients with macular degeneration, neovascular macular degeneration. And it got into USA Today, you know, Dr. Fung cures AMD and, you know, much to his chagrin, that really wasn't what he was trying to do. So a lot of people were using it off label. And although alpha interferon was used at very high doses in, in AIDS patients, we, we learned that this group of patients, perhaps not surprisingly, and maybe, maybe this is where the surgeon part of us didn't help, but they didn't tolerate those kinds of medications and patients on interferon developed uh, depression, some were suicidal. And so I think, you know, the, the proponents of that study, and that was really driven by David Geyer, Larry Yanuzzi, Tony Adamus, Evan Gergudis, and I, you know, we realized like this is, you know, we don't want to go systemic with this patient population. We need to think about local. And I think that was another piece of that puzzle. You know, historically, Joan, that that's a good point there, because uh, it's an example where uh, we were looking for a treatment and this had some hope. They had to go against photodynamic therapy at that point, right? What as to Jeff's point, there, there were we, we've forgotten those studies because we just don't even, you know, sort of pay much attention to them. Well, but, that also was the rise of Wiley Chambers, the, the rise of three lines of improvement, you know, three doses of <laughs> the threes. I mean. Well, so Julia, to that point, remember the end point in all of those phase three studies was prevention of moderate vision loss. loss. You could lose 14 letters of vision and that was a successful outcome. And these, and that was through the Marine and Anchor, through the VIEW studies for a FLIBR set. But then we started looking at mean change in vision and that became, you know, really what we were looking for because we're now we understand these patients should gain vision. And, and the, we started looking at more endpoints. That's a really good point. It would make a good case view, study in clinical trial development. Yeah, it was the VIEW studies where we really started looking at visual gain. Yeah. But, but I think one of the problems that's now come up is this three-line improvement now is crossing into other diseases like Which, dry matter. And is that an endpoint that we should be striving for right now with the type of treatments that we have? So the interferon trial, as we've just discussed, was negative, but it was funded by Roche. And at the time, that was $18 million, which in those days was real money. But Roche, you know, in the late 90s, owned a third of Genentech. So when, the, when Genentech had the data showing VEGF was a key player and they had the anti-VEGF drugs, there was this uh, macular degeneration, not a, good, not a good place when we don't. And Roche really in, influenced their interest in, in taking off. And it really wasn't until Macugen you know, really propelled them, but they got back into it. Well, and, and I don't think Genentech realized what they had at the beginning. Uh, they had Dave too many good tells, <laughs> tells the story of how he tried to get them interested yeah. uh, in, in pursuing this. And they just never thought that a drug injected into the eye for macular degeneration would ever uh, be, be much. Yeah, I remember Joan, you went, Mark, a bunch of people went and we're, we're talking to Genentech at that time. And and George Yanakopoulos talks about Dave Geyer coming to him and saying, you know, we think your drug is the best of all, um, you know, and George had just done another trial where um, nobody, they had gotten zero patients enrolled with intravitreal therapy. Uh, and he had been working um, with uh, Matt Dale, the PhDs at UCSF. No surprise, they hadn't been able to get any patients enrolled in the trial. So his board said, intravitreal therapy is a non-starter. There's no point developing uh, this drug. And so that's why Regeneron was late to the game. Well, they also went intravenous first, right? Which is interesting. And let's not forget the other key uh, interesting point for scientific reflection that Genentech made the decision not to pursue Avastin because it used an analogous molecule Herceptin in healthy young rabbit eyes, and it didn't penetrate uh, deeply enough to their satisfaction. Not thinking that an, an aged macular degeneration eye in a human 
uh, that the Avastin would penetrate. Everybody believed that. And, you know, so I, the iTech folks had that same notion. They just, nobody thought that a full length antibody would make it. And I remember moderating the session in Montreal when uh, the, the first trial results rolled out uh, and the, the room was packed with you know, the financial analysts and the reporters and uh, people were taking videos and it was, it was very, it was, it was exciting. Yeah, Julie is referring to the ASRS meeting in Montreal where the phase three Marina data were presented from Genentech's, you know, Renovism Aber Lucentis. And I think, I mean, she's right. That was an exciting meeting for a number of reasons. One, I think it was the first time there were more analysts in the meeting than retina specialists. And we, you know, now as a specialty, we're not so uh, surprised by that, but that was really the first time that had happened. And of course, the phase three results were just so stunning. And then, of course, at the same meeting, Phil Rosenfeld presented uh, OCT evidence you know, showing that injection of bevacizumab or Avastin you know, was, was effective in a single patient. So, you know, it was kind of exciting and, you know, you know, really changed the way things rolled out, I would say, with the anti-VEGF drugs from that. We had a paper right before Phil's because we had worked, it's Peter Cappuccero, I, Kwan Wen, had, we had some bilateral coronal neovascular cases. So we had admitted them to the hospital, put them in the infusion center, given them IVA Vastin, and it, and it had uh, had impact. But the idea of just taking it out of the bottle and injecting it. And I remember um, Phil presented his case and Quan Wen stood up and said, well, how did you pick the dosing? You know, was there animal studies? Was it laboratory? And, and he went, well, it's, you know, it was just the amount we could inject in the eyes. <laughs> yeah, it was It was 50 microliters. It was the same, same volume. <laughs> right, it was exactly, we we just took the same dosing. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it took off in large part because you had the phase three data with ranibizumab. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't be so comfortable pursuing bevacizumab. Remember that meeting, you you and I had been in South San Francisco weeks before going over the debt. So there was the Marina study that was presented. There was the focus study, which was ranibizumab against photodynamic therapy. Then there was Phil's study. And I remember Genentech was incredibly excited over these presentations. And then Phil gave his study and you could just see the audience going, hmm, this really, these studies really validate that Avastin works, doesn't it? And we have access to those right now before the others already approved. Yeah, because there was no, right, it would take a while before we actually could get the Lucentis in hand. And remember, Genentech had sponsored a huge party. This is back in the day. I think they had given like $100,000 for a massive party that night. And Sue Desmond Hellman was there and uh, famously said, I, you know, this is a company that's worked with oncologists who are lockstep with uh, exactly on label, you know, don't deviate from the protocol. She famously said, I had no idea that retina surgeons would consider using something off label. And of course, you know, that's so funny to us because from antibiotics on up, everything's off label. Um, I think all of you played a role at that at that meeting. And in a way, it really set the stage for the ASRS and its role going forward um, in, in our specialty. That was when the ASRS stepped up to the fore and said, we'll be the voice of retina. Avastin was out there. So everybody went, wait, um, we can't get Lucentis yet. Uh, let's, let's start using Avastin off-label. I was president of the uh, ASRS at the time, and we were suddenly confronted with Genentech not allowing um, ophthalmologists to buy the drug, throwing up all these barriers, uh, refusing to use credit cards. There were a whole host of uh, various barriers that they threw up, and it totally alienated the retina community. Also, in those days, remember, we had no experience with biologics. So when we heard the price tag on, uh, you know, what Lucetus was going to cost, I mean, I, I remember there were gasps in the room. You know, they, it was like $1,200. <gasps> <laughs> uh, people couldn't believe it. I remember on the board of the ASRS, there was a discussion about our next meeting, uh, taking the, the check from Genentech. And it, again, in those days, these were big checks <laughs> and asking all the reps from Genentech to get on the stage and then ripping up the check and throwing it at them 
uh, as a sign of, of, of total uh, rejection of everything they stood for. And I, even, I, I went, no, we are not doing this. <laughs> Thank God cooler heads prevailed for that moment, right? That, at that point, um, we contacted the Retina Society and the Macula Society. And, you know, they were supportive and interested. And you may remember that we wrote some letters uh, to retina specialists in the country and, you know, uh, talking about what we were doing, talking about our efforts to uh, discuss things with Genentech. Um, and, but little by little, it was clear that the people who were really interested in doing it, 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 it was us and the ASRS. And so um, I flew, I, I went down to Washington. Uh, Pat Wilkinson was president of the Academy. Art Levinson flew out from, uh, who was then CEO of Genentech. And we discussed, you know, how can we make this better? How can we mend this rift and work together? And they came up with, um, you know, the study that was a, a study <laughs> trying to start enrolling patients before uh, the drug actually got approved and marketed uh, so that, uh, and, and basically I think we were all in that and we were just putting every patient that we possibly could. So we put that, to, put the sailor study together and also decided at the American Academy of Ophthalmology to have a Genentech representative. And uh, that was the famous symposium where uh, Kirk Paco and uh, Sue spoke and uh, I was moderating it. We had um, I had the ability to turn off all the microphones in the room because we were afraid, you know, there might be violent scenes <laughs> and uh, there were guards on all the aisles. And um, I was hoping, I was trying to keep it toned down and, and calm. But Paco, of course, got up and took Ronald Reagan speaking at the uh, Berlin Wall as his model and had the, the PowerPoint where he showed brick by brick all the missteps that Genentech had made, you know. And then he gets to the top and he goes, Dr. Desmond Hellman, tear down this wall. And the place went wild. And poor, poor Sue, who's an oncologist who had never, ever confronted anything like this mob that was in front of her, was, you know, to her credit, she did as good a job as she could have, and she later came back and, and initiated a lot of conversations and I think was a good partner. Uh, but it was a very volatile time. When Lucentis was approved, it was approved at two different doses, 0.5 milligram for wet AMD and 0.3 for DME, but only in the United States. It was 0.5 in Europe. And I didn't know the whole story, but I used to say, I think it's because of the Sailor trial and Genentech being a lawyer-driven company. Remember, there seemed to be a mismatch of, of, uh, of systemic, uh, potentially systemic uh, side effects at the 0.5 that you didn't see at the 0.3, but it wasn't powered to show it. Uh, and so I don't think mo m many of us were that worried, but I think the company was worried, which then we all of a sudden we had to stock two different drugs for two different indications. So when ILEA came around, it was one more reason to jump to them as opposed to sticking with Lucentis. Jay, I, I do think that there were some who did have concerns about the safety. There were there were various things that showed there might be, you know, that's where the anti uh, antitransplatelet collaborative um, study started looking at all these and Sailor had this really um, unusually high um, grouping of patients who'd had MIs or strokes. And it, and it was, as you said, it was really not designed to pick that up. The, the strictness of which you were recording safety in the, that study. This this was really the start of one of those studies where it was really gave you access to drug and a minimum collection of other items. And, and subsequently, we've seen those risks really haven't manifested as you've looked at large um, Medicare databases as these we started going to the millions of injections you didn't see increases in MIs or strokes or. And I think that is pretty much put to bed. But but we do have to remember, too, that Sailor was large. It was open label and virtually anyone could get into it. And, and so we often forget to go back when we use a controlled multicenter mass trial to guide us in what we do, that some of those trials have very limited 
inclusion and exclusion criteria. But we like to extrapolate it beyond that. And we have to, we have no choice. But uh, things like 2020 vision, well, we all treat 2020 wet AMD, but, but that was never tested in any of the approval trials. We just, be, obviously, because it's so safe, we feel comfortable doing it. But, but it's good to remember that there are certain things that if you really want to extrapolate, like what's the risk of hemorrhage in the real world using an anti-VEGF? Well, you can't extrapolate from the studies because if a patient had a large hemorrhage, they weren't enrolled in those studies. And we know in wet AMD, you tend to, if you're a bleeder, you're a bleeder. So just to, again, a caveat there that uh, well-controlled trials uh, sometimes are extrapolatable and sometimes are not. So that's interesting because it brings us back to probably what will be the most unique clinical trial in all of medicine, which is the CAT trial. So can we talk a little bit about that? Because I think that was a pivotal moment in many ways for our understanding and use of anti-VEGF. I'll just lead it off by just giving a, a huge, huge uh, kudos to Dan Martin. He was, again, like a dog with a bone, and he did not take no for an answer. And he was able to pull off something, as you said, Tim, that was unique uh, and probably will never be replicated, but really was a super important study for our specialty. And we have to acknowledge like the NEI, Rick Ferris helped so much and insiders in, um, in, in national positions, I think made a huge difference there too. And Hopkins with Maureen McGuire there to be able to help with study design and Stuart Fine was in, involved. By that time they were at Penn, but yes. So um, Joan, tell us a little bit about that trial for, for our audience. I also would give great uh, kudos to Dan Martin because I think it was, again, not not something, you know, the retina surgeons or ophthalmologists had done to, to really do a comparison of this off-label drug with labeled, you know, for, econ you know, in large part for public health and economic reasons. But I think at the time, the CAT trial was extremely powerful in, in you know, letting us feel comfortable with the option that Avastin, Avastin was great and, and that's a good place to start. The off-label aspect of Avastin is really the incredible part. I mean, it was, I think, illegal for the NEI to, to support a trial that involved an off-label use. And Dan, with help of, of I think, uh, some people on this panel, was able to convince the politicians to actually pass a law that enabled Avastin to be used in this trial. Avastin, which doesn't even meet the criteria for intravitreal injection. And then they had to do the masking. And the, I mean, it was, there were just so, there was hurdle after hurdle. But yeah, that's, that's an amazing little story there, Jay. In the trial alone, uh, with just the number they enrolled, the fact that, uh, you know, some of the patients got Avastin ended up saving the federal government millions of dollars. And that's, again, one of the kind of the resonating things that allowed this to happen. But, but to get a law passed, to do a clinical trial in ophthalmology, incredible. But I also thought the way Dan and, and the team putting this together were able to put together both private practice and, and academic sites in such a collaborative manner to pull all those um, together to... They really got a lot of sites involved in this that had never been involved in clinical trials. And I thought that was important as well. I think that's part of what we, we've we alluded to, this sort of shift from when we finished training, retina was a surgical specialty. You know, it was the gases were still relatively new. It was laser, vitrectomy, uh, you know, macular hole surgery was hot. And then it's this whole shift to including you know, medical treatments and, and designing, you know, treatments for medical therapies, uh, you know, studies for medical therapies. I mean, that was the shift, you know, you could maybe, and maybe CAT is sort of where a lot of that had shifted. Well, and as I like to say now too, the lines between what's an academic retina practice and what's a private retina practice have become quite a bit blurred uh, by, on one side, the private practice is really stepping up to be enrollment centers for these trials. But another thing that happened is that the ASRS became aware that retina specialists were going, well, how are we going to do all these injections? And we don't make money on the injections. We make money on surgery. And, you know, how are we going to retool our practices? So we hired Monitor, uh, a guy named George Eliades, who later went to Bain, 
Um, and they came in and they said, no, 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 you're actually making more money on your injections and optimizing surgical, uh, optimizing your medical retina is uh, going to be good for your practices. And, and everybody needs to realize this and start working with each other to, to make this work. And that was the first time that a, a retina group, a retina society had made business moves like that and engaged consultants and actually presented uh, to their membership uh, something that had to do with practice. So that, that was another paradigm shift moment where ASRS again started moving into helping the retina, our retina community in a different way than um, had been done. So some of the more controversial aspects of anti-VEGF have, have been interesting, at least in, in my career. So the ROP story with anti-VEGF is remarkable. And as much as we've had an impact on neovascular AMD, we probably have saved more vision in these pediatric population at risk than we, we've done for anything else. So any comments on how, how that was able to be moved forward in, in, a, in a NICU population with probably the single highest risk from a medical legal perspective? But I think there was more concern about the toxicity, right? And the dosing and also the fact you didn't really know what blocking VEGF in terms of development of the eye would do. I, you know, I just, again, my, my pop, patient population myself is much older. Yeah, there were people who thought we were going to dramatically delay development and even in older patients that we were going to have significant CNS effects. So time has told us, as as often happens for those of us who go to the FDA for discussions, these treatments have been remarkably safe. Tim, you probably have a lot of perspective on the ROP treatment too. And, and, and South America was a big uh, early adopter. And I think that probably had some impact. Ugo Kiras Makado was the first one to inject in ROP infants for tunica vasculosis because they couldn't laser. The blood vessels were so extensive. And it was exact, that was the perfect example of almost the OCT because on day one, the eye, the eye was clear. So they, no one had seen that before. But I think, um, Jay, you're correct. A lot of this led out of the U.S. because of the, the necessity of being able to treat these children. Um, and the controversy really was exactly that. It was what is risk versus benefit. Um, and Genentech at the beginning had a black box label exclusion. So if you were using the, 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 that drug in an infant population, you were really taking a big step. It goes back to the retina specialists. We will do what's best for our patients. And that seems to be what drives us over everything else. And well, it, we will do what's best. But, but the point's been made that I'd like to reiterate. We can often judge that in our office with the ancillary tests that we control and we read. We don't have to send them to the laboratory for blood or an x-ray or do a biopsy of a piece of their organs to see if our treatments are working. We have it right in front of us. And so that is a huge advantage that enables us to individualize therapy. And we have the patient telling yeah. us they see better. Not, no, yeah. not, not the NICU. NICU. I like yes. the point yeah. about saving more person years of vision. That was a good one. But we haven't been talking about how much surgery changed, too. We, I mean, we alluded a little bit to the, uh, but I was, so when I was a fellow, Ron Michaels would infuse thrombin in the horrible diabetic cases to try to get it to clot. And then you would have these horrible clots that you had to then get rid of, which you had to excise. And so, you know, paired with the anti-VEGF, the small gauge surgery, valved cannulas, our ability to control the pressure in the eye, there, there, we have seen transformational advances um, in our, our surgical ability too, partially mediated by pharmacologic advances. The day of the three hour vitrectomy is long gone. When you had to hold the contact lens and so you almost fell off. But the poor fellow at the end of the day, you know, had carpal tunnel and... <laughs> The doctors I trained with their attention span wasn't that long. I, I remember Bill Benson basically saying once to me, look, if you can't fix a retina in three hours, just close up and try it again the next day. There's nothing else you're going to do. That was a Don D'Amico approach also. Don D'Amico also had advice that Joan, macular degeneration is not a bottle of wine disease. Your patients will not come back the next day with a bottle of wine. When I was, when I was first going into it, I, I would say those days have probably changed. <laughs> 
Well, we, we haven't really talked about sort of the patient impact of our therapies, and we all recognize that that's huge and is becoming a focus really for, for research going forward as a pivotal point in the decision process. Um, I'm curious as to what you think about um, the bispecific molecular targeting that we have. So traditionally, it's been anti-VEGF, and we've varied molecule structure. But what about this idea that we're going to look anti -VEGF -A. at anti-VEGF-A? Anti-VEGF-A or B and C. What do you guys think about using both arms of your molecule in unique ways? If you look at medicine in general, multifactorial diseases like cancers, like heart disease, I mean, these are treated with multiple cocktails and in sequential fashion, and also over the life of the disease. I think we're just beginning to be sophisticated uh, and if we look at our colleagues in oncology and cardiology, they're ahead of us in, in understanding nuances of, of that life cycle of, of chronic disease. You're right, Julia, but the, the using oncology as an example, they're, they're much more attuned to having multiple medicines on board, adding another one, and it's okay if you get a better response with the other one. We're, we're not used to kind of mixing and matching. The FDA's wanted, you know, a single single medicine. Otherwise, you got to go for superiority, which I'm not saying is wrong, but it just makes it a little more complicated to layer things on. VEGF was more key than I think anybody thought, including those involved in the research. I mean, we, it's it's so successful. It does kind of slow you down on looking for other pathways, but I think clearly there are other there are other targets. Again, maybe at different stages of the disease that we need to go after, or different biomarkers, as we've said which we can eventually show to the FDA and then get a drug approved based on another biomarker. But that's going on right now in, in obviously dry MD and geographic atrophy, looking to treat sooner with better biomarkers. So what an amazing discussion today. I'd like to thank all of you on our panel that have addressed the story of anti-VEGF and its impact over the last two decades. Um, Dr. Miller, any last comments? You know, the anti-VEGF story was an exciting time to live through. And I just would say for all the youngsters that, you know, there's a lot more work to do and uh, we expect you to innovate and you know, we'll pass the torch. Well, so Jay, thoughts? I would is reach out to the, to the younger generation also just to say that the anti-VEGF story is a generational story. It's something like this. This type of innovation does not come up often. But there's more innovation out there in other areas that are going to be your generational story, whether it's neuroprotection, geographic atrophy, glaucoma. Uh, it's out there and keep keeping inquisitive and keep asking why. Dr. Howler, Julia, thoughts? I'm so proud that we have been at the tip of the spear of medicine in so many, so many ways uh, in uh, my career. And uh, the last 20, 30 years have just been very exciting. It's been a, a wild ride in many ways. Uh, but one of the things that came out today is how much more there is to do. And um, I'm, I'm very proud also of uh, the American Society of Retina Specialists and the leadership role it's taken in emerging really from science to bedside to clinical trials, to advocacy, to business and medicine. I look forward to cheering uh, as that goes forward. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Heyer, uh, Jeff, you've played leadership roles in multiple societies. You have an amazing clinical practice. Any comments to leave us with today? You know, who would have believed for the four of us who were all intimately involved in this, that those first injections we were looking at, those first preclinical trials we were studying, that they would have had this dramatic effect. So for all the young clinicians and investigators out there, keep an open mind. They're, they're, that next advance is, is there. And whether it's already something that's being looked at, whether it's right around the corner, have an open mind because there's advances and excitement that we still haven't achieved and they'll be part of it. So I just want to thank you all. Great, great story, great discussion. Um, but I also want to recognize how many of our colleagues also played a role in bringing this forward. I, it's been an amazing collaboration between industry, FDA, the societies here, our members, and, and really all focused on what is best for our patients. So 
Thank you for taking us through that journey.